Gail Ann Dorsey, welcome to Guitar Summit. I think we should be welcoming people to Guitar Summit. Uh, welcome you to my little studio. Uh, you're in Paris right now, I believe? Yes, I am for the moment, yes. Okay. So for the moment, when I look at your life and your career, the, the very few, um, I was very surprised to see there were very few interviews with you for, for such an unbelievably long and huge career, at least a very few interviews that have been uploaded to YouTube. That's true. That's true, actually. Right. Um, but very... What I've seen through that is that there, you, you just drop these moments in like, oh, yeah, and then I moved to Amsterdam for a year. And I lived in London for 12 years. <laughs> and I lived in Kingston for 20 years. Like, super casually, and, and now you're in Paris. Have you always kind of felt on the move? Yes, and always wanted to be on the move. I mean, uh -huh. as, as, a kid, as a kid growing up in Philly, I, I was never the sort of person who wanted to um, stay in my hometown and be around the family and settle down. And, you know, I'm not nostalgic in that sense or just feel like I need, needed to do that. Um, I always wanted to see everything. I wanted to travel. I wanted to get out in the world. I was a big movie fan, a movie lover. So I watched a lot of films growing up. And I, saw, I want to go there. I want to see that. I want to do that. And, and that's, I, the great thing about music is that it's, it, it has, fortunately giving given me that opportunity to do a lot of things that i would never have had a chance to do so so has that helped you never get like burnt out on the road i'm sure there have been times where it's not easy but it's yeah yeah certain times you know i mean i'm glad that um i think you know coming up in the beginning i did my my share of van tours and sharing the driving and you know lugging my own amps and i feel fortunate that as my I have advanced in age. My gigs have got a little more comfortable, so it's it's going. It was going going the right way. I don't know where it's going right now, but it was. So yeah. it, so no, the fatigue of traveling it didn't get too too bad in the end. But more more so, just missing um, um, in the later years, of my my last years of re, of touring or recent years of touring is just missing a kind of chance to have a, a sort of normality in terms of like a routine. Right. You know, for myself, like, you know, to, to cook my own food, to take care of myself better, because I think uh, traveling, it doesn't lend itself so much to, uh, you know, taking care of yourself, especially if you're on a lower budget. It's very difficult. Right. Well, I, I want to ask you about that for sure, because you have been uh, from, from the outside looking in, you've been on the biggest of the biggest tours throughout your career. With I've been on some big ones. Yes, right. indeed. Uh, I, I've I've been around some of that and seen that there are some there were always advantages and disadvantages to constantly being on the move. But one of the advantages to being on bigger tours seems that you do get taken care of much better than, like you said, being in the van and shit and driving. Do you have a process like a, a baseline? No pun intended, but like a foundation, like a line that you don't like to dip below in terms of your physical health, your mental health, nutrition, hydration, routine, and stuff like that on the road. Are you able to form something that keeps you kind of okay? If I'm here, I'm good. Well, I think for me, it's it's mostly um, eating habits. You know, diet has has been something that has become increasingly more important for me in my uh, later years, you know, just to, just to, to, because taking care of the inside of your body is like what you eat is so, so important. And um, I think that I've just tried to make sure that if there's, any, if I have any say in what catering is with dinner, or if I have any say about what I get to eat after a show or before a show, or if I have any, any input on, on the cuisine, that's where I try and make make my mark in terms of making sure I eat well at least. Sleeping, um, you know, is another thing, <laughs> but that's not always easy, especially on buses and planes and airports and early wake up calls and different things. That well, I want to I wanna throw you back to 1997, um, the later part of the year, 1997. I want to say that you played a couple of shows, maybe the Aragon Ballroom or the Roy Wilkins Auditorium somewhere in October as I was researching your tour history with David okay. and then okay. those are kind of like nice size venues they're about 5,000 people um, sure. that's that's not a small number of people now five days later you walk onto the stage at the Foro Sol in Mexico City which is 65,000 people that's right this is five days apart these are two very different worlds how do you maintain that 
that world? Uh, how did you maintain that world as a band, as a unit, as a sound to translate in so many? I've looked at your your, your touring career. It's so many different size venues. Sonic. Very, very different, right down to the tiniest little places, even with bigger acts. Um, you know, personally, for me, it, it never really matters what the size of the audience is. Um, I give personally I give the same thing musically I, I treat it as just as important right. I have to say it's kind of overwhelming when you you do a show like with 65,000 people or I think one of the biggest shows we ever did with David was Ross Kilder in, uh, which is a festival in Denmark I think yep, yep exactly it's like 80,000 people or so I mean people just as far as the horizon that you could see there was just people Sometimes in my head with those kind of shows, what goes through my mind is, can they possibly hear me? <laughs> I mean, I feel like I'm, my amp, my big Ampeg stack is like a transistor radio. I'm like, how can they possibly hear me? But of course they have incredible sound systems and it's possible, otherwise they wouldn't be there. So that there's a little sort of thing where my mind kind of wonders sometimes, like, I can, you know, how, how are they enjoying this? Is there, a thing with the visual? Of- is there a thing between the visual, like you obviously have a great in-ear mix, so you're hearing yourself and everything sounds yes. great on stage and there's this visual of like these ants, basically, right? Well, you see what you can see, you know, you see the first rows or the first section of the audience and as long as those faces are happy and they're bouncing up and down, it's like, you know, and you just feel the energy. What you can't see, you can feel, and it's certainly in a crowd that size, you know. So... It's all, I mean, I, I really don't care what size the audience is or how big the stage is. I just want to be on the stage and, 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 and giving music to people because that's where I feel most comfortable. <laughs> so that, that's interesting. When, like, when you have to perform more than you want to perform, because obviously yeah. as human beings, no, we that happens. Down, you know, what's the place you get yourself to stay like, true to the art? kind to the music and authentic to your fellow musicians as, as you, as you experience that. You know, I'm going to tell, I guess it's not really a secret, but I, I've never actually, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that question or quite that way, but there's something that, you know, I definitely, you know, on a long tour, there's definitely nights you don't feel like going on stage. You just don't, you're a human being, you're tired, you've got whatever, you've got a headache, you've had a bad day, you've had bad news whatever the flu so but there's something that happens to me regardless of a good day or a bad day when i get on stage when i start to play it's like a meditation for me i'm in a whole nother kind of zone because it's like i'm you know certainly with my i'm a self-taught musician i don't know how to read music particularly i'm not like technically very very good um, but I, but I, I feel like I'm channeling something like that. I don't even understand how I know how to do it, but I hear it. I can hear the music before I play it. So I, I really work with my ears. And, and when I have a day when I'm not that focused, when I get it and when I've got, I'm not feeling like really I'm tired or whatever the reason, I think of things that inspired me as a kid. Like I think of in particular this is, I've never said this to anybody. I'm going to give you a brand new thing I've never said in an interview. Like, for example, one of my favorite films as a kid was this, the 70s version of A Star is Born. I'm a huge Paul Williams fan. I like this kind of music. I like those kind of songs. I was a Streisand fan. I was Christmas stuff. It was just great. And, and that was, I was about 14 when I, that film came out, and that's when I got my first bass. And when I was really, really starting to concentrate on one, knowing that I really want to write songs and I want to, I want to get on stage. I used to be so enthralled with this live recording of this particular record. It's a beautiful, amazing. And so I would think as a kid, I used to listen to it and it was like something that charged me up, got me really, like I would imagine that, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm playing that bass line and I'm on stage and there's Streisand and Crystal, you know, like I'm part of this great sounding band playing these great songs and when I have a bad night no matter who other person's music I'm whatever music I'm playing I imagine I'm in that band wow I swear to god that's what I do and it gets me charged again and I go yeah man I'm just like 
it puts me back into where that that recording was. That's something that something that little trick I use, what or some other something, some other live recording that I've heard that that made a big impression on me. I, I put myself in that place of the feeling that it gives me to listen to to that. It wow. makes me get through the night. And then once I kind of get going and, you know, things fall away and you're in the show and the right. audience is responding well, it just takes care of itself. So is there some adrenaline that sort of takes over at some point? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you have a bad night no matter what. You have a few clams and you just, you know, whatever. You're just kind of not syncing with other people. Maybe someone else in the band had a bad night and they're not kind of, you know, you're not sort of... Are you feeling, s- not feeling the drummer aware? or whatever it is. Are you hyper aware of that, your your fellow musicians in the band, like especially Absolutely. once you've been working together for a long time, I would imagine, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You can tell. Yeah, like it becomes like family. You know, you get takes as I join new bands, it takes a while to get used to what people do, how a drummer interprets something or how the keyboard players who all for the head of the beat for some reason. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what it is about keyboard players, but they're always like a little faster than everybody else. We are outing keyboard players. Keyboard players are <laughs> <great. laughs> But we love them because they're awesome. And, uh, you know, but it's true. You know, there's, it's subtle things. It's, I mean, and that's Absolutely. not like... And, and the, uh, two of, the, two of the, 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 the gigs you're most known for, I would guess David Bowie and, and more recently Lenny Kravitz have had... Mm-hmm. Uh, each had, to, to my knowledge, a, quite a major shift in the drum chair from Zach Orford to Sterling Campbell and then from yeah. Cindy to uh, uh, Franklin Vanderbilt, right? Franklin Vanderbilt, yeah, we, and those, then we had a tour with Cindy a few years back. Were those, were those major moments for you? Was that a big shift? Did it take a while to get used to this new personality who, who commands such a wide part of the sonic kind of spectrum in the band? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think Franklin Vanderbilt is, is honestly one of the best drummers I've ever played with. I think he's quite underrated. I, I really do. I've heard this guy do things other than Lenny Kravitz that will blow you away. And I'm not kidding. He's got the best shuffle I've ever heard in my life. He's from Chicago, so I think he's born with that. But man, is he a great drummer. Um, uh, Cindy was very, it was hard because she's a jazz drummer. Yeah. Really. It's I mean, and that's where her, that's where her yeah, and that's where her passion is, and that's where like her idol is Tony Williams, I think, and it's like it's that the sort of fusiony thing, the Miles Davis thing. So that was a little hard for me because only because what Lenny's music demanded and demands is this very precision. He's very precise with his thing. He likes it to sound like the record. He likes it to have a certain thing because he's, you know, and I appreciate it because I'm a, I'm not exactly that far into it as he is, but. I, I like to play my own instruments too, and so I know what I want to hear, but he's very, very stickler for what he wants to hear. And so when he plays his own records and he plays everything on the record, the drums, the bass, the guitar, the, you know, whatever, it's hard because you're living up to something. You want to give him what he wants to hear, you know? But Cindy was hard. To, it was hard to kind of rein her into that, that spectrum a little bit, considering that Franklin was very on with it. He had been doing it for, for quite a while, and she kind of came in. She hadn't been back for a while. So that was a hard adjustment because I was still in that framework, but I was working now with a drummer who was taking a few more liberties. So you have to kind of move with that and feel what that feels like. So it's always a challenge with a new drummer. As a bass player, always a challenge. And then some of them are like a, just an old chair. You go in and you start the first song and you just sit back and you go, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. I love you. <laughs> it's such a relief, that feeling of just, ah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you're not carrying anything. You have, you've got your feet up. <laughs> you're just happy and you just play what you need to play and you know they're going to be there and feel how you feel. And I'm a hi-hat person. Okay. A lot of, a lot of people, when they talk about bass and drums, it's like the kick and the snare and the, 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 the right. making sure that the beats are on the thing. I mean, yeah, that's, that to me is the obvious, but to me, the feeling of a drummer comes from how they work with the hi-hat, if it's involved in the pattern, of course, but like on a sort of pop gig where, where there's usually hi-hat in drum pattern, I, that's what I listen to, to, fi- to feel what, to, to almost try and guess what the drummer is here, like how he feels or she feels, how, what they're hearing. It's in, that, it's in that hi-hat pattern for me. So I have to make sure that I hear that really loud in the, in the mix. So it's interesting, with, with Bowie, it appears like you're on the hi-hat side of the stage most of the time, and with Lenny, you're yeah. on the 
the side of the stage. Does that make any difference because you're on in ears, or is there yes, some it, sound? Yes, it did for me. I didn't really enjoy that position with Lenny, but I looked at his whole career, and he always had the bass player on stage right. I guess yeah. you know, I was how they say that stage right, and my whole. My entire other career, I've always been on the, the side of the hi-hat, always, right. no matter what. So it was kind of odd that it was the other way around, and Craig Ross was on the hi-hat side. Um, so I did have to make sure that the hi-hat was louder, because even with in-ears, you don't hear everything, but if you're kind of next to the hi-hat and next to the drums, you, you're going you're gonna to feel that, because I'm getting, from Franklin, I'm getting a shitload, excuse my French, of cymbals. You know, because he, he, the yeah. ride, I'm like on the ride Washing. side and when he goes yeah. crashing on that. It's kind of like that has to all come down. Like I have most of his overheads down. I just have that hi hat cranked and kick and snare. And then with with Zach Alford and and Sterling Campbell, that was another big change, right? With Bowie. Yes, but they're both great drummers and good friends. And um, uh, I don't know if I had a preference. I, I used to think of them as animals. Like I compare them, someone asked me once what was the difference of those two drummers and, you know, Sterling to me it was like an elephant. He had ground, he was like this strong drummer that was like, not plotty, was, he didn't play like an elephant, I'm just doing it as, right. a, as a, you know, like if you could visualize the movement and think, because an elephant is beautiful. And then Zach was more like a gazelle or a... A, a, a cheetah or something like you jump on and woof, off you'd be flying you know and they're both like amazing animals but they're so that was the feeling i used to feel with the, the two drummers playing the same songs you know it was like sterling was just, is so so like grounded as a drummer zach's a bit more lanky almost like his build right very wide very wiry and and and, and just kind of like everything's but so exciting both both drummers are tremendous i've been very lucky i've played with some great drummers another great great drummer brian mcleod who i played with in tears for fears phenomenal drummer was he on the role in the kings of spain record yeah. that whole, yes that whole yes, thing because I, I wanted to talk about your sound you mentioned earlier that you're not you're self-taught and you're not this and not that i mean i think you are all that and everything else and a lot more in terms of the way I, I feel your sound, whether it's on a record, mm -hmm. live in concert, I, I, I watch live shows on YouTube. It's a very bass forward sound without ever getting in the way. Like you play this lead but supporting role at the same time. Which is to me, that is the role of the bass. Like I love that. I love that role. I don't need to be any more busy than I am. Uh, sometimes I'd like to, but I, that's where like you have a bit more skills than me in that department because I don't know. Uh, no, seriously, in terms of feeling comfortable enough as well to, to try some, sometimes I don't try things I can hear because I'm not exactly sure how they're going to come off and learning a bit of theory. I would know what that is. You know what I mean? The, the little bit of theory I've learned, I've learned a few different licks and scales and things that, that where you have, you hear that pattern, you go, oh, that's when, that's what that is. That's a, whatever. I think, again, I don't know the name. I forget the names of what you call those things. But I like, I love the supportive role of the bass, but also the bass is, in, is the controlling role at the same time. It's like two incredible positions that, that no other instrument in an ensemble fills. Right. None other. That's, and it took me years to learn that because I come from guitar. I'm a, I'm a guitar freak. I started, I wanted to play guitar. I had no interest in the bass whatsoever. And I got into bass by accident. And as the years went by and I got better as a bass player and started to learn more different uh, scenarios I had as a bass player from the tiny little jazz clubs in London or wherever I played, busking the street, you name it. I learned how to appreciate what the bass does with each extra gate. Like I would, you know, and every time you make a mistake and every, the, all the things about the bass that I'm sure you know as a bass player. And I just thought, wow, what an incredible instrument. And so I'm kind of proud to be known as a bass player because I think it's one of the toughest roles to play in an ensemble of music, no matter what kind of music you play, whether it's bass with the guitar or the left hand of an organ or whatever it is. That part takes a very huge like precedent in in in, in songs, so I um I appreciate that you say that because that's that's what I strive for just to be like 
able to also being a singer, the, the joy of playing bass around a vocalist is very important. And I also think that's helped me in terms of working with some of the singers and the jobs I've gotten. Because I think it's being, as a bass player, a lot of times, uh, I don't know, it's like sometimes bass, bass that's too busy in something doesn't work well with vocals. And a lot of players who are technically a million miles better than me might not get a job because they are not able to hear the relationship between what they do and what, so they need to do less here. And there's always room to do cool fills. I mean, God, look at all the, you know, look at Leland Scalar and Tony Levin and Nathan East. And like, I mean, those guys have the tastiest fills you've ever heard. And that's what I st strive to do is to stay out of the way, keep enough, keep it together for everybody else to make their magic. And I love that role. Let's say that's such a grounding a kind of motherly role in a way, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like keep it, keep it there, and let everybody else play and do their thing. And you know, you know that you you can drive that car any way you want to drive it, but like kind of let it. <laughs> I, always, I always say I feel like I'm driving the bus from the back. You know, like that's I, it. That's you, exactly uh, it. And everyone's that's up. Exactly, and just, yeah. That's exactly what we do. That's exactly what we do. We we totally have the wheel as bass players. I that I have learned, and, and no one can convince me otherwise. <laughs> and if they want to try, let them get in a band and make a few screw ups. And so you you so mentioned that. you mentioned London. Um, I know that um, I, I read or I heard an interview that John Stevens was a big part of your life. Yes, he was. And he back, got in, back in the day in London, with uh, around the era of, I guess, like Courtney Pine and people like that. Exactly. London, exactly. London jazz music. Yeah. So, jazz music and Sade, all that whole that whole era was coming coming through. The Thatcher years. Right. <laughs> in London, all through the Thatcher years. Yeah. Wow. That. Was, yeah, John Stevens. I met him. Okay, I was in a completely different yeah. direction there, but you mentioned the Thatcher years, which were brutal years mm -hmm. of, of British politics, and yes, actually one of the worst times to be in England that you chose, like politically speaking. I didn't know, but right, yeah, of course. I felt it. you were in your yeah. early 20s at the time? Early 20s. I think I was 20 when I went there. Not 80, yeah, I would have been 21 that year. Now, 83. So taking into account that it was kind of that bad comparatively to what had come before and what came after politically in the UK, did that give you, it now comparing it to the states where you came from, from Philly, I think you said you lived in New York a little bit before that, right? So did that give you a, 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 a very different filter at a very important developmental time in your life, in your 20s, um, a different filter to view the world through in terms of the hierarchy of the music industry, of civil rights, of all these, you know, things a little bit outside of music compared to the States, which doesn't have the greatest history in any of those categories. Absolutely. No. How, how was that? Like, what was your, what did it look looking, look like looking through that lens from the UK as opposed to the US? It was, I think it was a great um, eye opener to my, it was my first time ever out of the United States. And I didn't go back to the United States for four years. I went on to other places. I got to go to Paris or Amsterdam, or like, you know, to explore a little bit of Europe. But I didn't return to the States for four years. And it was a, it was a real eye-opener in terms of certainly culturally, musically, was the best thing I could ever have done. Uh, I, couldn't believe, I couldn't believe how, uh, I mean, I, I could feel it when I was in New York and when I was in L.A., but I, I never really like could experience I had nothing to compare it to but the, the UK was you know despite what was going on politically artistically creatively even though Thatcher was trying to shut it all down pretty much a lot of it was closing the council the GLC all those things I'm kind of remembering all these names <laughs> um but they they because they had all these great community they had so much um of of the the local uh, communities had art, like theaters, the grants you could get to put these. Right. I played in these bands that had all these these grants from the council, and they put, could put together a thirty piece band with horn sections. And, you know, I mean, it was so it was great, and I could get all these little gigs, and you got paid. And it was like I never got paid for anything musically in the United States, not a single thing, until I went back years later. Um, so 
it was um it was really great to see also that there was so much music um that was very mixed uh there were in terms of looking for a record deal which is what i was doing once i got to london it took me a while a couple of years wherever i got to you know have some other experiences get into the session world a bit but i um i could see that the, the record labels and what was on the charts and what was on top of the pops, what was what people were listening to, was just this wide variety of music. And what I was presenting in New York and what my original, my first album and everything that I was writing and working on was not, it wasn't polarized enough for the United States. It was like nobody could, could see, what, you know, it, they could just see a black woman walking in the door with her cassette tape, with her demos or whatever. And then it didn't sound like R&B or it wasn't hip hop or it wasn't whatever it was, whatever they thought I should have been playing, I wasn't playing. And in the UK, they didn't give a shit. They didn't. It was like, we like, do we like what you're doing? We don't know. We don't care what you look like or where you come from. It's like, do we dig this music? <laughs> and wow. it was an eye opener. It was so, it was like, oh, what a breath of fresh air, you know, that there's a community. And then that extended across Europe, you know, from Amsterdam to Paris to, to Brussels to wherever, you know, it, there was this more open music, uh, more mixture of, of mi different artists doing different music. And then there was Terence Trent Darby and Nina yeah. Cherry, all the other Americans yeah. who came right. to England, and they were huge in Europe. But they couldn't get a look in in Detroit or wherever they were from, Cincinnati or wherever. <laughs> so there you go. I, being in London was one of the best things I ever did. Wow. Um, you seem to have built an amazing amount of trust. Am I correct in seeing that in like in the people that you have worked with? There've been quite long associations with David Bowie, long association with Lenny Kravitz as a freelance musician. I'm not sure younger musicians, if they're watching this, understand what a cutthroat world that is now. And the gigs don't yes. just keep coming mm -hmm. forever and they don't all last yes. 20 years. Um, yes. But you've yes. been able to build a massive amount of trust with the people you've worked with. Is that something you have felt as a, as a musician in those situations? Yes, I have. Um, and, you know, it's interesting you say that because a lot of some of the older ones, obviously, David has passed away. And I've worked with people like Olivia Newton-John. And, you know, I mean, they're getting on in years. So there's not it's it, I've had I've had the great blessing of having a period of time with these particular artists, with Lenny, with any, you know, you know, three, four years with Gwen Stefani, whatever. It, it, all those things have been um, really nice. But it, it's true. You, there, being a good musician is, is you know, almost 100% of the gig. But a really important part is getting along with people. Right. And I, I'm, I personally am happy that people like me <laughs> you know like that i but i you know what i mean i i don't i i guess i'm i'm quiet you said in the very beginning i have very few interviews i'm pretty quiet i'm a i'm a very i'm private uh, pretty private with my life for the most part you know i don't feel like that why is that of anybody's interest who cares <laughs> they just want to listen to music or not because i don't if i don't know you it's like what's the point but i get it um but but you have to you know put it this way that if, if there are young people listening and they care about this part of the the, the question you asked me is that it's very important i've seen I've seen more than a few people get fired from a gig, a particular gig, because the artist does, they don't get, especially don't get along with the artist, or they have some, there's some kind of chemistry that's, that's missing. And I think trust is a big part of it, especially for a really big artist, and, or any artist, or anyone who's in the limelight. It's like you have to, you have to respect their position um, and not exploit it and not feel like they owe you anything or not feel like it makes you anything special. You're there to play music. You're there to contribute to this. And if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Make your own music. But if you really want to contribute to an ensemble and make, make something fun with someone, that, with other artists, you have to have a certain amount of, um, you know, respect and, 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 and keep your, yourself you know relating to everybody try and get along with everyone it's very important and and i think 
that I've been lucky with that. It seems that that's maybe part of the reasons people do call me for these gigs or, you know, most of them I didn't look for. I wasn't trying to lobby for a, a certain gig. They come, they've come. they come to me through word of mouth or something like that. And I think that word of mouth must have been good. So that's my tip. <laughs> Respect the artists that you work for and, and, and try and, and serve your job. Like, take pride in your job. Take super pride in what you do. And then com conversely, as a, as a freelance musician, um, how have you had trust in, in the process, especially when I look at kind of your, your, your um, touring intensity? The intensity has been high in places and very low in others. You go from like 97 to this super intense tour, and then 99, I think you guys played nine shows. In 2000, you played four shows. Two at the Rose, yeah. one at the BBC yeah. Theatre, and one to a quarter million people at Glastonbury. That's four yeah. stream shows. Yeah. And yeah. only four shows in one year, 13 shows in two years. That's not something to live from, necessarily. Yeah. How do you continue to have trust in that process when it is so up and down? despite the fact that you're in the inner circle and are very much a part of the of the tour? Well, you know, I don't ever, that's another thing, I never, ever, ever take for granted that I stay in that inner circle. That's something I learned from the very beginning when jobs were quicker. You had a little, you had a few little shows here. You did somebody's, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, showcases and right. stuff for record labels. and Or you did a, a few club dates for a friend. Or, so I just always was hoping, you know, if there's a gap, I am looking for something else to do. And if I can't, if something else doesn't come along, that's when I work on my solo stuff. So that's when I do start going out with my acoustic guitar and I do some local gigs and I make a little money or, or I would open for another artist like Ani DeFranco. I went on tour with her in Europe and just opened for her with my acoustic guitar. When she, you know, so I was always looking for another gig or, and if there was no, never any more coming, I would go really concentrate strongly on my solo career. I like both things, but, uh, you know, I don't mind being a side person, but I, I, you know, I can work as a solo artist. So I just used to never assume that David would ever call me again. I never assumed that Lenny's going to call me back for the next tour. With Lenny, it was a little different because, and I worked with Seal for a year with the same kind of thing. He did a lot of corporate shows. And those corporates keep the, 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 the actual system running. It keeps everybody salaried. It keeps people paid. It keeps, keeps things rolling. So, so there would be more work with Lenny. So I knew that that was more of a continuous thing. It wasn't going to be a huge six months gap before we, another gig or you did five. So I knew that that was a machine that was always up and running. But with Bowie, with Gwen Stefani, with Tears for with any of those artists, you just, I don't, I never assume because then you, then you're really crushed, you know, and I don't want, I don't need to be crushed. I want to keep looking for a new thing to do is, you know, of course, sometimes it's hard because if you think you want to continue working with someone or whatever, um, but I just never assumed, never. I, every year that David would call me back for, or every other job that came or whatever record came up that he wanted me to be on or not on. I just never assumed. I was like, every time I said goodbye, even though we would keep in touch or we'd send emails or we'd talk about the latest movie or whatever, I never assumed we would keep going. So it was always a, a blessing for me. And w with your solo stuff, I'm really curious. I, I saw you gave an intro, a video intro to Fanny, the band Fanny. Yeah. So I'm a huge fan. I have him. Oh, wonderful. When I heard that, I was like, oh, I have to ask you about this. Um, the arrangements, the, the, the level of musicianship and the playing on those records is on a whole other level to me. It's insane. And it's unbelievable that they're not more well known as, as one of the big, biggest, one of the greatest female, all female bands ever, certainly right. to come out of the U.S. I mean, and they're musicians. So when did, were you aware of them before you started working on your solo stuff? Because I listen to some of your solo stuff and I think, damn, the, these arrangements are badass and the playing is great. There are so many parallels I can draw between what you do as a solo artist and what they do that's awesome. Uh, which I take as a huge compliment. I, d I did not know anything of them. Bowie introduced me to them. Wow. Bowie said something to me one day. Uh, we were talking about, I guess, female musicians or something, you know, or bass players. Earl Slick was married to Gene, the bass right. player. Right. So uh, then I knew more about them once Earl joined the band. 
But David mentioned them, and then he was like, you don't know Fanny, you've got it. So then I went back and checked them out, and I was like, oh, my God, how could I miss that? You know, even the, the keyboard player, I forget her name now. Nikki, Nikki, okay. Nikki something. Okay. She was playing on Streisand. She's on Stony End. She's on Streisand I Records. I didn't know that. Yeah, so she was in that sort of session world, I guess, with Carol Kay a little bit, or doing some of those more sort of, you know, uh, main, mainstream sort of records back in the early, late 60s, early 70s. So she's an amazing keyboard player. But yeah, I, I went back, and then now I'm friends with June Millington and very close with her. And I, I'm, I'm a like a 90 minute drive from her school, from the IMA. Mm-hmm. I've, in fact, I was there when, when Bowie passed away. I was at June Millington's house for a vocal workshop for the weekend wow. in Massachusetts. Wow. So I'm really good friends with them now, and I've learned so much more about Fanny. I've, I've given some. Uh, there's a documentary coming out about them from a filmmaker in Montreal and she came down to New York and I shot a thing in my home studio. So I'm part of the documentary. Right. It's so exciting, but those women are amazing and everyone I show them to is freaking out. You know, I fetched Franklin Vanderbilt. I remember showing him a clip or something. He was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> These women are kicking, butt. you know, they are amazing. They're so good. Have you been aware throughout your career as um of of the amount of influence you've had over women in music over black women in music over younger musicians in general but particularly female musicians if you, is there a certain layer of responsibility that has grown with that for you are you aware of how much of beacon i imagine you are to so many young female musicians i think i've been more aware of it in the last few years I've been aware of it in myself from the beginning because I felt like I never had enough as I started to learn more more or see or experience more female musicians who were, were amazing, which there are millions of them. Um, I, I didn't. I felt like I didn't have a, a lot of examples growing up, especially as a black woman. Right. And one of my biggest biggest influences and gave that gave me courage actually to just kind of really be true to myself and not try to be R&B or like try to be something to fit in was Grace Jones. And when I saw Grace Jones for the first time, I was like, there's hope. There's hope for me. And her thing came out of Europe. It came out of Paris. It was Jean Paul Goud. It was all this whole sort of Europe. So there was, again, there was this thing. I was like, I really got to think I'm going to have to go to Europe because they're just not getting it over here, you know. Was that oh, a big she was, catalyst for the move? Still big, excuse me? Was that a big catalyst for the move, seeing Grace Jones? and that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it was. Absolutely. It certainly was a, a, a thing that was like, I've got to get to Paris. I've got to get to Paris. <laughs> I've got to get to France, you know, because it seems like they've got this wild, cool, crazy stuff going on there. And she was just... She was just so different, but didn't give a shit. You know, she came out with her thing and the, 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 the half man, half woman, whatever. It was just brilliant. It was art, which I love, you know. It's like it was theater, it was drama, and it was, just had something that was different than other black female artists. So that just gave me a thing to say, whatever I'm doing, I'm never going to be Grace Jones. I'm not trying to be Grace Jones, but I want to be me. Like, I want to play, you know, whatever I want to play and make it work because I believe in it. And she obviously believed in what she was doing. She wasn't doing it for anybody else but herself, you right. know. But she was very original and very authentic. She was just being the artist that she is inside, you know. And, and she was so brave. And still is, so I, I imagine, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I was just showing to my partner the other day that we looked at the Queen's birthday or whatever it was, the Jubilee, which I hadn't seen her for years, and she came out with the hula hoop. We were watching that just the other day, and it was just mind-blowing. I was like, she's still in, and she's in, you know, in her 60s, almost 70 at this point, probably. So she was my idol, and I felt like, if anything, I just have to, maintain my integrity that is the thing that will that 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 some other kid woman black woman particularly or female artist musician whatever will see because that's what's important we need originality it's starting to get missed you know now more than ever and what was great at the time when I assume we were younger I'm assuming maybe we're around the same age you're probably a little younger than me but um 
is that there was such a variety of things to choose from, more of a variety of things. There's always a genre. There's always pop. There's like, you know, things, teen music, whatever. But within that, the artists were so different. And I feel like everybody's trying to be one thing. You know, you have the TV shows with the, the competitions and, the, you know, it's, and everyone is sort of, I don't know, we need more originality or, or, or the, for, for artists to be brave enough to just be themselves. Well, you seem to have embraced perhaps more than most musicians in modern history that uh, the, the concept that experience isn't something that gets handed to you with a congratulatory handshake after winning a television talent contest or reaching no. a million followers on Instagram. Not at all. Experience has to be earned. There's, there's nowhere else you can learn any of this stuff except on the job. That's... That's something you seem to have embraced more than e almost anyone I've ever seen. Because that's, what's, that's what it's about, is the experience. You, know, you can dream about it for the rest of your life, but you have to, if, you, if, you, if you're lucky enough, and some people don't have good luck, it's just yeah. the way it is, or, what, or karma, or whatever you want to call it. Because there's a lot of artists out there that we may never see, but we should see. Sure. And there's no, no one knows the reason for that other than whatever, the universe or whatever, whatever you believe in for knowing that. But I also think you have to just like, you have to love what you do. You have to want to do that. You have to want it, you know? So you sacrifice things. You, you do what you can to get that experience because that experience is exhilarating. Right. It's exciting. You know, it's not troublesome. It's not tiring. Okay, it's a sleepy night on the bus or it's a whatever, whatever the experience might be, you know, or it's somebody's couch right. where it's got cats and you're allergic. You know, it's like all of those things. But it's part of the experience and you just kind of have to love it because the reward is immense. The reward of standing on a stage or be or whatever it is now, Zooming, whatever it is, the reward of, of giving music to people it's just huge. It's huge. When you, when you feel that connection, there's nothing like it. It's an incredible language. Okay, so to wrap up, we, I, I, could, I could go on for eight hours asking you questions. I, I <laughs> like to hear you speak, and I, 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 I want to hear what, what else is inside your brain. But just, to, just to, for, for, the, for the sake of our, our listeners and everyone watching and, and this being somewhat succinct, I want to end on... I, w I want to ask you if there was a moment or has been a moment, maybe a long time ago, maybe very recently, where you felt like you started to own it and you felt that kind of, it doesn't matter. I'm okay with the outcome no matter what the, what the process is. You know what I mean? No matter what I go through in the process. Is, has there been a moment or is that something that's been gradual for you? It's probably been in the last... The last four or five years, I can honestly say for the first time in all these years, and it's like I just turned 58 years old two days ago, and happy birthday. Happy birthday, you. yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, <laughs> but I have to say like about five years ago was the first time I could say I'm really good, I'm good, really good at what I do. I really was always afraid especially because of the lack of knowledge, the lack of study, the lack of having a teacher in the beginning, the lack of knowing how to read, not knowing chords or what the theory was or, you know, just mistakes I'd made, whatever things, you know, I used to feel insecure. God knows if someone changed the key, I would lose my mind. You know, like in the middle, so, oh, let's just drop it down a whole step. I'm like, oh my God, because I learned by patterns. So there was all these things that used to make me so frightened on a job and just sort of hypersensitive. But about five years ago, I started to go, you know what, I can handle this. I have handled just about everything that has pretty much come my way. Even I played once with this like fusion band, which is so not my thing, which is a great guitarist that lives in Woodstock. Um, he was in Lee Von Helm's band. Now I'm blanking on his name. But anyway, it was like really fusion-y music, which is so not my thing. And I, and I nailed it. So, and, you know, I, over the time with Lenny, because we were on this very long schedule of, of stuff that was already planned through it, like a year would be planned almost the whole year. So there was very little time in between gigs to take something else. And I definitely couldn't take another tour, but I turned down a lot of very interesting tours during that time. And that also was like, you know what? These are the people that are calling my phone. I must be good. 
I can't, I can't pretend that I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not able to handle something. So I have to say, I have, I feel like I've earned my place. And I don't say that with any arrogance, but with, but with pride um, that I worked hard and I've dedicated myself to what I'm doing. So I feel like I can pretty much handle most things now. At least I can, I'll, at least I'll give it a shot. <laughs> That is beautiful. What a, what a beautiful thought. Um, what a beautiful sound, a beautiful person, a beautiful mind. It is you, has been one of the great you. pleasures of recent memory to talk to you. Um, I appreciate that. And to, share, and to share part of your story with people. Um, th yeah, so thank you very much for your time. I hope we get to do this at some point. You're so welcome. You're so welcome.